I haven't done one of these before, so it's an interesting uh, experience, but uh, I'm excited by the possibility. I was asked to talk about trends in headache medicine. I've got one of these fixed things, so I, they feel a bit weird. I don't know if people can see me or not. Can, can they see me on the video? No, okay, so that's fine. Um, so the voice should be okay. Um, I'm going to cover a range of things, mostly things that are happening in the world of uh, migraine, uh, migraine therapy. So I'll, I'll think I'll just kick off. I'm not sure if you can see, it would help me to know if you can see my um, mouse moving around. I'm guessing that you can. Can someone wave at me if they can see the mouse? Excellent, thank you. That's, that could be how we do our interaction, waving is very good. So I'm going to talk about some things that are happening in genetics. I'm going to talk about what's happening in, a little bit in the imaging side, uh, migraine aura, pain mechanisms, and around some of the treatments and, and what's been emerging in the last uh, little while and certainly focusing on the last, uh, last 12 months. I, I, I should say I understood that the format was we wouldn't have, there wouldn't be any questions during the talk. I, I can't hear any sound, so I suppose, um, and I couldn't make out hand signals, so that won't matter. Quite a lot has been demonstrated, I think, about the genetics of migraine without us actually making a lot of progress on where, it, where, that's, lead, where that's leading. So if you look at familial hemiplegic migraine, the genes are identified. It's not entirely clear to me whether they're genes that are simply a reflection of the aura phenomenology or have something more complex to do with the rest of the migraine attack. Certainly, they've been profitable in, uh, in terms of understanding the biology of aura, and I'll return to talk about that a little bit more, uh, in a little bit more detail. There are these two new genes in the last little while, the TRESC and the CK1 delta, the casein kinase 1 delta gene. The TRESC is a, it's a potassium channel. Um, it's found in a family with a familial migraine with aura. Unusual family, I have to say, from what I've read of this paper, and we haven't seen... Uh, this reproduced. So that, that, that's a, a bit of a work in progress. The CK1 Delta story, casein kinase 1, these are people with familial advanced sleep phase. Um, they go to sleep about this time in the afternoon and they wake up in the early morning and feel absolutely splendid. Um, they, they have a migraine with aura that runs in that family and uh, it was first observed by, um, by Bob Shapiro and then Lou Tachek and uh, Andy Charles, Casey Brennan and others have made contributions to understanding that. I'll return to that because it's, be, it's been interesting to compare some of the biology that we know about the middle hemiplegic migraine with what we see with, the, uh, with CK1 Delta. These are the, uh, the SNPs, the susceptibility uh, loci that have emerged from the genome-wide association uh, studies, the GWASs. I draw your attention to two of them, or three, um, this one in particular, the TRIP uh, M8, is uh, the menthol channel, uh, the transient receptor potential channel that's involved in the detection, uh, the transduction of cold. And the top one, PRDM16, is interesting because of something, uh, some data I want to show you that emerged at the European Headache Federation Migraine Trust meeting just a little while. These don't, these account for a small percentage of what's happening. They, I think, I think that there's much yet to come from the genetic side of things. This is where it's headed, although this is not going to change your practice this afternoon, but you can see those of you trainees and res residents and people getting going in, in this, well, this is, where, this is where this is headed. It's a good example of what the genetics is going to eventually do for us. So these are, uh, this is a study from the Danish Headache Centre where they did what they described as a semi-structured migraine interview, which um, which for most people would be a, uh, probably a, a rigid uh, like um, tooth extraction, I should imagine, their idea of semi-structured. They took blood samples. They looked at the 12, um, the 12 SNPs um, from, that, from, the, uh, G, from the GWAS, so they looked at, the, looked at these and did some logi logistic regression modelling and looked at drug responses. What they were able to show was that one of the SNPs associated with this PRDM16 had an odds ratio of 2.6, which was significant for efficacy to a trip 10. Okay, um, it's a small, you, we're not going to go and do tests like this to work out who's going to have trip 10, and it's not an absolute indication, but it, it tells you where this is headed. 
that we could be able to start to get a grip on who would respond to a medication, who might have side effects. Really, I think this is the thin end of the wedge at the beginning of seriously thinking about what people describe these days as personalised uh, medicine. So uh, it's, it's early days, but it's quite exciting to tell you where things are headed. I think another thing that's happened in the last little while, which is, is really starts to ask some important questions about how we understand uh, migraine mechanisms, and I'm thinking particularly about triggering, are uh, some studies that the Danish Headache Centre have done and then some work that uh, Richard Lipton reported in neurology uh, this year. So triggers are a very popular topic. Migraine patients love to talk about uh, what, triggers, what triggers them. What the, uh, what the Danish group did in the first uh, study here that I've listed is to provoke migraine with, they're looking to provoke migraine with aura. So they've got patients who said that they're always promoted by, provoked by lights or exercise. You can see that of these 27 patients who absolutely clearly said they were provoked, only four of 12 were triggered with exercise uh, and none could be triggered um, with lights. Now, it could be because they're in an experimental setting and there's lots of explanations you could, you could give for this. It, but one of the explanations which is attractive to me is that some of the things that patients say are triggers aren't triggers at all. What they are is the earliest part of the attack. And I think some of the explanation for this lights definitely trigger my um, attack, but then when you test it, it doesn't work, is that the lights aren't really triggering most of these people's attacks. What's happening is they're getting photophobic during the premonitory phase. I'll come back and talk about that because it's an interesting way of thinking about some of these uh, symptomatologies. And it, and it, it, it leads into this the stress and migraine question. Of course, if you ask people about uh, migraine, many will say stress triggers my migraine. And what Lipton did here was a detailed study, 22 people, 30 days of electronic diary, looked at a stress scale, and what they found was two things. One which I think is pretty consistent clinically that patients will, will tell you that when their stress is reduced, they're likely to get headache. A lot of patients will say that, and, and that's what they found in this study. They also found that increased stress wasn't associated with predicting a migraine. And I wonder whether this finding and the light finding uh, lead together into thinking about some of these triggers actually is the earlier, not triggers at all, but manifestations of the premonitory phase. And again, I'll, uh, I'm going to return to that when I talk about the, the imaging, but um, just to say that the, this question of triggering is being studied. So a few things about, Im about imaging, um, which will follow into this. So we've known for quite a long time that whether you have spontaneous migraine, um, Shashazi Rafridi and uh, Nikki Giffen, um, looking at spontaneous migraineurs in the PET scanner, you get pontine activation, or whether you trigger them, um, you can get uh, pontine activation, this is work Anish Bara did some years ago. And certainly we've triggered larger groups and the activation is if they have left-sided um, head headache, during the migraine attack, they'll be triggered on the left side. And these, these uh, subcortical, particularly these brainstem observations, seem pretty, um, pretty consistent. One of the things which has happened in the last year, and it's just gone into press in neurology, is some more work, and uh, many people are working on these questions of, of connectivity. So there are two big ways to do this, to ask questions. There are so-called seed uh, methods, or you might say non-biased methods. The non-biased methods uh, to apply something called principal component analysis. You ask the analysis to work out what areas of the brain are changing with other um, areas. Now, in this particular study I'm showing you, what was done is that areas were seeded on the basis of clinical phenomenology. So the visual um, cortex is, uh, is, is, is seeded in people with phonophobia, auditory and uh, phonophobia. Um, the PONS was triggered for the reasons that for the reasons that it's been active in both triggered and nitroglycerin triggered and non-triggered um, spontaneous attacks in the past. And what stands out from this is that if you ask, uh, if you compare controls with um, patients interictually migraineurs, that the anterior insular part of the salience network is connected, more connected, more active in relationship to uh, visual or uh, auditory cortex, or indeed uh, to the uh, dorsolateral pons. So these, all of these, um, if you want, imaging and then the clinical side of things, point to uh, salience uh, network involvement in, uh, in, in migraine. It's broadly consistent with some work that Till Springer 
presented at the American Academy uh, a few years ago. I think that we've got a long way to understand the detail of this, but it's consistent with the general view that migraine is a network dysfunction phenomenon, and as we put the pieces together, we'll understand that uh, a whole lot better. Now, I think a useful paper that came out, but this is from us, so uh, I'm biased to say that, is to start looking at the premonitory phase using imaging. So this is the day or so before an attack, typically patients will say they have neck discomfort, uh, they yawn, they feel tired, concentration impairment, mood change, pass more urine, crave uh, sweet or savoury things, and then they'll go on to have a um, headache. And in this study, what we did was trigger patients who had premonitory symptoms and, their, and record their premonitory symptoms and then get them back on another occasion, re-trigger them um, in the scanner. We were particularly interested in things that are very um, diencephalic, if you want to, and, and yawning is a good one because it's got these dopamine connections that we're uh, quite, quite interested in. And what happens when you do this, uh, this when you do the comparison between the, the, the symptomatologies like yawning um, during the premonitory phase, it's triggered compared to baseline. You see activation in hypothalamus um, down here in uh, periaqueductal gray and again in this dorsal, um, dorsal lateral pond. Now the first thing to say is that none of these patients are in pain. So it removes the question that's been present uh, basically since ever uh, these studies were done, whether this was just a reaction to the pain. Well the answer is no, uh, because they're not, um, not in pain. The extent to which these areas are turning on migraine or some of them are trying to turn it off is a whole other, whole other question. But that the brain stem and subcortical uh, regions are involved in the earliest phases of the attack uh, is certainly true. Now another thing to think about in this context um, on, the, on the next slide, we've, uh, I've shown here um, for patients who are photophobic during their premonitory phase. So no pain, but they were photophobic. Now, this is before the attack has start, started. Imagine for a moment that in this period of time, the patient normally notices that light is more bothersome. And instead of saying, oh, I'm in my premonitory phase, what they do is they, they say, oh, I eventually get a headache, so therefore lights must be triggering my headache. And I think this is a, an explanation for some of the things, some of these triggering statements patients make. Stress is probably bound up in this in the sense that if the brain is not functioning normally in the period just before the attack, probably everything looks stressful, or life looks more stressful, so to speak, although nothing's actually changed. And I, I, so I suspect that some of what patients say about their triggering is actually identification of the premonitory phase, and they, they just they can't know that. But they are right about the fact that the two, uh, two are linked. It's right for the wrong reason. What I show on the other side is just really um, anatomical, physiological curiosity, if you want. Uh, we, got, we looked at a subgroup of patients who had nausea versus a group of patients who didn't have nausea in the premonitory phase and were able to show, um, as you see, um, medullary activation in the, um, in, in, during nausea in the earliest phase of the attack. So there's a, it's, uh, it's probably, I mean, PET is difficult for anatomical localization, but we could say this is probably the nucleus of the tractor solitaris or in that, in that region, which would be a good... Um, anatomical, physiological explanation uh, for nausea. And that doesn't advance things other than to say that the brain is uh, obviously involved in that process. This is a study which we presented at the American Academy this year and tries to answer a very old question in migraine um, with a, which people have discussed for quite a while and it concerns the blood-brain barrier. The question is, is the blood-brain barrier normal or not? So what we did with this study is use dihydroglutamine, DHE, labelled with carbon-11 um, and got arterial blood both in the, base, in the controls and in migraineurs uh, and triggered, the, triggered migraine attacks and in, the, in the controls or gave them GTN for comparison. And we looked at our influx rate constants um, comparing the attack and the baseline um, both in, within migraineurs and between migraineurs um, in control. And after all of that description, uh, what I can show you is effectively nothing. Um, you see, we couldn't find any uptake at all, uh, baseline versus migraine attack. We just couldn't, couldn't see any difference. So we can't find any evidence for uh, alteration in blood-brain barrier uh, permeability to dihydroglutamine during uh, an acute migraine. Negative studies don't prove anything, but if there's something going on, it, it's really quite modest.
and one has to take that into consideration when we're thinking about how medicines uh, work and how we should be designing them because the blood-brain barrier is not going to help and then where the, where the act, side of action of these drugs is. It's not to say that no dihydrogotamine could act in the brain. You would see um, quite clearly that what it does is it gets into the CSF and certainly into the choroid plexus. So you can see it here pooling um, within, the, within the brain, which is, which is interesting. So structures that are along the surface where the CSF is running will have access to quite a, a concentration of, of of DHE, but certainly structures like um, like in the thalamus um, or the the uh, cortical areas, they don't seem to have to access uh, to it at all. What's happening with aura? This is a pretty typical picture that many of you would have seen before: fortification um, that are drawn by a patient on a on a fort, uh, Homburg from the 17th century, and this is why they're called fortification spec. This is Narden in the Netherlands, just for um, just for comparison. So aura has been a topic that neurologists uh, love to think about um, over a long period of time. This paper came out not so long ago, which is an extraordinary um, example of, uh, of clinical observation. It's a chap who's a mechanical engineer, as I understand it, who carries around a piece of paper, a pen and a measuring tape, and then uh, wh when he gets an attack, he draws, he measures where, he, his, where, he, where his nose is to the paper and then draws what's going on with his aura, and you see this is one of the drawings. And what Andy Charles and, um, and Hansen did was recreate that and um, they've got a cartoon drawing of what's happening with the progress of his, uh, of his visual disturbance across, um, likely across his visual cortex. And it follows the, largely the kind of prediction you would make from the idea that this, uh, this, the process of this is, a, is the uh, cortical spread of depression of, of the owl. So it's a, it's a nice clinical validation of that uh, of that observation. Now, on the lab side of things, what's been happening, uh, I mentioned earlier that the familiar hemiplegic migraine has been good to us in the lab. This is the knock-in uh, mouse of um, van der Magdeburg and, and Ferrari's group that shows when you are recording cortical spreading depression, it's uh, easier to, uh, to excite it in animals with the, one of the, knock the common mutations of familiar hemiplegic migraine type 1. This R192Q Q mutation and the velocity of propagation is changed. So the, that the mutation has a, an, uh, an, an effect on this phenomenon of cortical spreading depression. That's clearly true um, in, in mouse. Now we've been trying to get at this question of how that might alter more broadly trigeminal function to try and understand if that mutation is relevant to other parts of the migraine attack, pain for example. What we found uh, a couple of years ago was if you take the R192Q uh, mice, you see there's less actually C less calcitonin gene-related peptide, CGRP, expressed in their trigeminal uh, ganglion and also indeed in the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, which at some level is counterintuitive is two possibilities. One that there is less and the other one is that they're more excitable and, they've, and it's, been, um, it's been released more easily so there's less of it to aim at. That's, that's an un, unresolved question but certainly they're different in the trigeminal ganglion in the nucleus caudalis. Now we started to, to try and explore that at a next level and this work came out in Neurobiology of Disease um, this year. We looked at CFOS expression as a marker of <coughs> excuse me, neuronal activation. And we could show that, um, so, so we've got the wild type mice, this is control, this is a sham, and this is stimulation of the wild type mouse. So you, you see FOS activation with stimulation of the, of the, of the dura, <coughs> very sorry, in, my, in mice, which is what you'd expect, and you can turn that down with narrow trip can. Now if you take these 192Q mice and you do the same experiment, you see this quite a difference between their, activate, their response to stimulation and the wild type mouse. In fact, the response is blunted. <coughs> so it does suggest that there's less transmission going on down in these, um, down in these second order neurons. And indeed, there was no, no statistical effect of, uh, of narrow triptan. So it's possible that the, uh, the focus of the mutation um, 
pathophysiology, if you want, is not in the trigeminal system, at least in second order, order neurons. And some data we presented in abstract suggests that it might actually be in the third order neurons uh, up in thalamus where the effect is seen. Now, looking at this in another way uh, for the CK1 delta mutation, what I'm showing here is that um, we took mice with the, the mutation that's seen in these CK1 delta uh, people who've got um, present with migraine uh, with aura and then asked the same sort of question. This is, the, this is what the CFOX uh, looks like. So we asked ourselves the question, if you uh, look at, this is wild, this is wild type uh, stimulation, this is wild type sham, so you get uh, an increase of FOS activation in the sham, in the wild type animals, just as we've seen when we were doing the R192Q, so that's the control. But when you take the CK1 delta mice, again, there's no effect of stimulating the, uh, the, the dural, um, dural afferents on FOS expression in trigeminal nucleus for these mutant mice. No difference between sham and, uh, and active. So what it tells you is this is, the behaviour is broadly consistent with what we saw with the FHM mice. And it may be a theme that if the mutations are, affecting, are producing these migraine with aura phenotypes, that the, the burden of the disease is more rostral than trigeminal mechanisms. That's a hypothesis I'll offer to understand that phenomenon. I want to say a few things about trigeminal pain uh, mechanisms. I think this is an interesting paper and a series of interesting papers that Andy Arn produced in the last couple of years. And they start to question these observations of Harold Wolf here, the austere looking chap, and John Graham, uh, his colleague, published in the 1930s. And that was the the idea that measuring uh, temporal artery pulsations, you could reduce them with ergotamine and that was the whole explanation for the way ergot drugs uh, work. Now it has to be said that when people look into this in any detail, this just doesn't stand up. And one of the more interesting observations I think is this work of Andy's, where what he's been doing is getting patients to tap out their throbbing and correlating that with, uh, with cardiograph, with uh, ECG. And as you can see, there's basically no correlation um, between the two. So while we all think, I think we've all thought that throbbing must be like a vessel phenomenon and have something to do with, with, uh, with the pulse, when you look into it, that's not so clear. Um, and it goes to show you that, that, that you can do really simple, interesting experiments, particularly in, in a context where people have just assumed, um, assumed certain assumed things. And you wonder what is the thing that's cycling that they, that, that, they talk, that they talk about. The other interesting paper in this regard on this pain and vessel thing, it's nice work from the Danes who did uh, patients with migraine who had uh, migraine without or during attacks and looked at their external carotid circulation and internal carotid circulation um, in detail, so spontaneous attacks with MRI. And you know, the important thing is they found no change in extracranial vessels or the basilar. Now that's to con contrast with our uh, colleagues uh, here in the, in the 1930s. This is entirely, and the only thing they could find was a 10% change in intracranial vessels, and the percentage they measured was using the... Um, was using the circumference of the vessel rather than the diameter. So, you know, divide that by pi. It's a very, very small change, which is, doesn't respect the side of the pain and doesn't um, change with the, with, the, with, tri with the triptan treatment, even if the triptan helps. I mean, the bottom line is that there is no measurable correlation between what's happening in the vessels and pain um, with lat respect to lateralisation or with respect to treatment. And it predicts that if we develop... Uh, non-vascular uh, treatments to migraine that they will work. And that's caused a good thing for all of us and for the patients in particular. We've seen some discussion in, the, in terms of uh, pain mechanisms about this uh, reflex I'd talk about for a few minutes. The trigeminal autonomic reflex that goes through the sphenopalatine ganglion, uh, this is brainstem connection, superior salivatory nucleus, and these are the symptomatologies that result from activation of this uh, system. Now, normally you'd look at this and you'd say, well, conjunctival injection, lacrimation, nasal congestion, he's talking about cluster headache or trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia. But I think if you ask all of your migraine patients this, then many of them, many, many of them, will admit to one or other of these symptomatologies. Now, it's true to say that 
If you give enough pain to healthy subjects, this is uh, Akam Fresser and Stefan Evers um, injecting capsaicin into German medical students and producing this uh, symptomatology, or uh, Mark Oberman doing more population-based questions in, in migraine with aura, recording the same symptomatology, or simply going and looking at paediatric migraineurs, which is something that's, not, that's more recent, um, you can see from a very young age, about 70% of them will have one of those, uh, one or other of these, uh, of these symptoms. So this is a common phenomenon, and it really is not to uh, respect the type of, of migraine. It's common, these symptomatologies, and I think that uh, certainly in terms of, um, in terms of uh, migraine, they tend to be um, less lateralised and a little bit less consistent. But the idea they don't occur in other conditions is just, uh, it's just not correct. And we need to be factoring in this, uh, this system more broadly to understanding uh, migraine, I think. It's one of my uh, sort of favourite slides which illustrates a, a principle you'll see in patients tomorrow. That is that uh, many patients will, discuss, will talk about neck discomfort, neck pain during their attack. And a lot of that, I think, is to do with overlap of first division afferents and cervical afferents that come here to the um, C2, but also um, end up going up to C1 and up to nucleus caudalis. So this cartoon of showing trigeminal uh, activation in second order neurons with, uh, with uh, dural stimulation or with C2 stimulation illustrates the basic system. I think this is because this system is set up to warn us, not for localization. So there's no point... Um, no, there's no point trying to put your fingers and scratching the, the superior sagittal sinus, that wouldn't make any sense. So when, when there's activation of these afferents, I think they're meant to point out there is a problem, uh, not meant for localisation. And you can see, you can demonstrate that whether you've got uh, activation uh, in the cervical system, in the trigeminal system or cervical system, you can see sensitisation from, from either. And, and I, so I think that the problem with neck discomfort in migraine is very substantially a, a disinhibition of this trigeminocervical um, complex which allows patients to think they've got neck discomfort but, or pain or there's some problem with their neck but indeed all that's happening is that the third order neurons that these trigeminocervical neurons are projecting to or cortex north of this so to speak, rostral of this, uh, can't tell where the problem uh, is coming from. What's happening with treatments? Uh, CGRP is the, the sort of the big story for this year, and we, so we need to talk about that because people uh, press and lots of people are interested in it. This is the simple trigeminovascular pain um, setup, if you want, um, with the dura mater being innervated by branches of the first division of the trigeminal, which is the, the receptor. There's a serotonin 1B receptor out here and a 1D receptor on these nerves, and yeah, this projecting in through the first division to the nucleus caudalis, C1 and C2, um, again with the 1B, 1D and 1F receptors within this system. Now the transmitter across here and out here is something called calcitonin gene-related peptide or, or CGRP. If we could block CGRP without having to constrict vessels, we would have a non-constrictor way of approaching migraine. And so that, that, that tests an interesting question and offers a way forward in order to show you what's happened with that in the last little while. The CGRP receptor story is going to be a lot simpler than the tryptan, the serotonin receptor story. It comes from, there's, there's a family of uh, receptors, calcitonin and calcitonin generated peptide family. Now the way they're constructed is there's two of these seven transmembrane G protein coupled receptors. One's called the calcitonin-like receptor and the other one's called the calcitonin receptor. The calcitonin receptor is a receptor for calcitonin. That's, that's it. That makes it quite, quite sensible. The calcitonin-like receptor gets its pharmacology based on what little protein sits with it. These are called receptor activity modifying proteins or RAMPs. So if you take a calcitonin-like receptor and it sits with a RAMP1 on the cell surface, that's the, that, is the cal, that is the CGRP receptor. And you can see you can make drugs with great specificity that only have, where the receptor only the only difference is that if the CLR sits with a RAMP2, that's an adrenomedullin receptor, and this, these drugs just aren't active at that receptor. So this very, very small change makes a significant enough conformational change to change the agonist and the antagonist, uh, the antagonist around. It's a nice piece of biology in terms of the way uh, it's, all, it's all preserved. So the calcitonin, the CGRP receptor is effectively 
um, one receptor. There's some activity that CGRP has at the um, at the amylin receptor, but it's less, uh, much less important as you can see by some orders of magnitude. So the story behind the CGRP uh, idea comes from some uh, observations that uh, Lars Edvinson and I did some years ago. If you stimulate trigeminal ganglion in cats, you see CGRP and substance P release. If you do it in humans, you see you see both of those and the reason for doing this was to try and develop animal models that were reflective of human change. And if you ask, if you then say to yourself, well, the trigeminal ganglion's got all sensory things and you really want pain, and what produces pain? Well, the dura. If you stimulate the dura in a cat, you'll see CGRP release, but you won't see substance P release. Now, this predicts that in migraine, substance P shouldn't be important, and in migraine, uh, CGRP should be important. So if you then take migraineurs in the 19 late 1980s when things were bad and there was no trip cans and they were having dreadful attacks and we saw them in the emergency room, or at least I did. Um, in this group of patients, we could show CGRP uh, release. Um, we didn't see any substance P release, I haven't got on this diagram. And then when we gave them a trip tan a couple of years later when, they became, when that was available, the CGRP was reduced. So this predicts that if you could block CGRP, you would have an anti-migraine effect and if you block substance P, it wouldn't make a blind bit of difference. It also predicts that the good thing about the CGRP receptor antagonists is they don't, they're not vasoconstrictor themselves. So if they work, then here's a non-vascular way forward. Various things happened uh, over, this, over this time, and it's just worthwhile looking at how these things were tested. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, so this is a substance P receptor antagonist of the Glaxo company that five of these were tested. This is placebo, this is active, it really doesn't work. These are the neurogenic, it's one of the two neurogenic inflammation blockers, this plasma extravasation, very effective in this animal model, not so effective in humans. This is something I found on the web this year. It's been around for, maybe everyone knows about this, but I haven't seen people talk about it very much and I squizzied along and found it on the web when I was searching around for something else. This is actually a, tra uh, a transient receptor potential vanilloid 1, a TRIP-V1 receptor antagonist of Glaxo Welcomes that these are effective, again, in this plasma extravasation model, and they wondered whether the, this uh, um, TRIP-V1 was playing a role in migraine. You can see the outcome from their randomised parallel group placebo-controlled trial. Nothing. These are not effective. It's reported on the line at the, at the EPIC meeting a few years ago, but it adds to the, further to the story that this inflammatory concept uh, is probably wrong because the drugs that are all being developed for, all three of them, they just don't work. This, in comparison, is the um, pain-free data for the first of the CGRP receptor antagonists, Olsegipant, which is the Burringer one, and it's pretty obvious that that was going to work from, from the get-go. i just point out something which is useful in terms of looking at clinical trials, because I want to show you some clinical trials. This is the sumatriptan naproxen um, development program. Uh, you take sumatriptan and naproxen, they both work, you add them together and you get a better result. And there are two studies and there's lots of patients. That's not so important. What I want to show you is that the placebo two-hour responses are 9% in that one and 10% in that one. And this is the placebo two-hour response in the sumatriptan development program, well, it's 9%. There's a number there. They're all more or less the same. So, whether, so placebo two-hour pain-free responses in acute migraine studies are very robust. And when they're not about 9 to 10%, somewhere in that range, there's something odd about the study. You could tell it's not a randomised parallel group study or something happened. It's quite, it's quite a good internal uh, control, I think, because you consider these were done um, better part of 10 years apart because this is the developed sumatriptan development program from the 1990s and they're done by different people at different times. So just hold that thought for a moment. Take that thought forward to this, this, uh, this collection of studies. These are all the CGRP receptor antagonist studies. These are all double-blind, parallel group, two-hour pain-free. This is an intravenous study with an up-down uh, adaptive design. And this will tell you straight away, because it sits out, doesn't it? 10, 9, and 10. This one stands out. This is also an adaptive design study. So if you do ordinary um, vanilla parallel group studies, the two-hour pain-free ought to be about 10%. And there they are, done by Merck, done by Beringer, done by Merck. So it's a very good quality control. And what these show you is that each of these, the CGRP antagonist, tell KG Pant here, uh, the Burringer one, the Bristol Myers Squibb one, and the other, the backup um, Merck one, all do better than placebo. So clearly, this mechanism works. 
On a population basis, you can see that it's always a, a bit shy or there and thereabouts what a tryptan will do. So that whether these are different patients, zolmitriptan, elitriptan and sumatriptan, whether these will be different patients or the same patients, we, we don't know that. What's happened with um, this drug and with, the, with telcagipan and MK3207 is they both died in toxicology, so we'll never find out. I'll come back to return to that. The important thing is that this slide proves the principle that these drugs work, and it establishes also that you don't need to constrict vessels to um, control migraine. And perhaps that's a, it's really taken us since the 1930s to recover from those uh, concepts of Wolf and Graham. Now, I want to move from acute treatments to what's happening in prevention. And I want to use this as a said way, the same sort of way, just to give you a background for what to expect. These are the tapiramate studies, the three big tapiramate studies. This was the European one, uh, 100 and 200 versus propranolol. This is the two US ones, uh, 50, 100 and 200 milligrams. The thing I want to draw your attention to is the 50% responder rate for tapiramate done in the US in different studies or in Europe, 22, 23 and 23. Most well-powered, properly controlled, parallel group preventive studies the 50% response rate is about 20 to 25%. It's remarkable how consistent that is um, when, you, when, you, when you go look at it. So bear that in mind because, it's, again, it, these, these placebos are a very good way of asking yourself the question, is the new data I'm seeing relevant to the kind of practice that I know? Where does it fit in? How do, how, how do, how do, I, how do I settle it? And I think that these placebos are useful for that. I think, in general, if companies that won't show you placebos have got something to hide or certainly want to ask them and get it out of them. So, what's new? Nice study, I think. This is uh, the second study by the Norwegian group, Stovner and others, looking at candesartan in migraine. First thing, 50% responder rate, 23%. Okay, that's right on the money. And look at the, uh, the candesartan response and the propranolol response, 40 there and 43 here. So this is probably, pro it seems internally um, to, have, uh, to have a validity. Uh, I find this actually quite useful. This is a, a nice study. Um, it's small, but you know they got the result and don't need to have more patients than you need to have. This is with candesartan as a, a migraine uh, preventive. And it's a pretty good drug. I mean, single, do uh, single day dosing, relatively well tolerated, a little bit of mild dizziness, um, and, 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 sim and simple to use. And uh, you know, I, I would commend it. To, I commend this to your reading and consideration because uh, you know I, I, having new drugs to use as migraine preventives is, a, is really a, quite a bonus for everybody. And this thing has come off patent now, so it's not even particularly um, expensive. And I have to say I'm using it before I'm using propranolol these days because it's simpler to use and less uh, side effect prone. Do all of these drugs work? Doesn't look like it. This is the Tell Me Sartan uh, data from a study of Dina's. The p-value speaks for itself. It just wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, effective. It may be that it's not the, NG, the A2 um, receptor blockade. Um, it may be there's something else about candesartan we haven't worked out yet. But it's certainly not, a, it's certainly not an effect which, which runs across all of these medicines. So I never use this one. It doesn't seem sensible um, given, the, uh, given the data. This is just to put it in context for botulinum toxin uh, type A. This is the meta-analysis of the preempt, two preempt studies, 35 and uh, 47% for the 50% responder rate. Why is that higher? You're asking yourself the question. I think that's because the control in the preempt studies was probably um, not a control, more an active uh, treatment, if you want to. I mean, effectively, it's like, um, like acupuncture. So I, I think that's probably why this, this placebo is higher. It's the one that I've, uh, that I've, that I've shown you. Um, Going to other things that are happening, this, is, uh, this will not ever be used because this is the study which produced the, um, the liver enzyme problems with telcagipan. But it goes to show you, uh, one of the principles we've had so far of acute and preventive treatment is that acute treatments are acute treatments and preventives are preventives and you don't cross the two. That seems wrong mechanistically. So this is a CGRP receptor antagonist to telcagipan. I showed you previously this is effective in acute migraine. This is a preventive study, 140 and 280 milligrams, 50% responder rates. First question is what's the placebo like at one month? 22%. That's pretty good, it's in the right sort of place. And this, these are the one month effects. I had to terminate it early because of these uh, raised liver enzymes. 
So this drug is not going to be a preventive, but it shows you the principle that if you could inhibit a CGRP mechanistically speaking, you'll get a preventive effect, which is a useful piece of information going forward. And it also starts to question the dogma that we can only develop drugs that are either preventive or acute treatment. So I just I think that's probably um, wrong as well. So where's that led? That's led into the whole the antibody story, which you're probably hearing about now. There are four antibodies that are being tested in migraine um, against a receptor antibody against that calcitonin-like receptor um, ramp one complex. That's the Amgen um, monoclonal. Three CGRP peptide antibodies, two that have reported out from Alder and Arteus, that's Lily now, and one uh, Labrys, I'm sure, sorry, that's a five, but I should say Teva. So the two that are reported out in Lancet Neurology, the references are down there. This is a 50% responder rate, 75 and 100% responder rate. This is at three months. This was dosed one gram once. This was dosed 150 milligrams every two weeks. First thing to say is these are pretty big. So these are smaller studies, and I think the investigators must have over-egged things a little bit here to drive these placebo rates up. That said, the effects were significant um, at the three-month period for um, both of these. And if you take that, different companies, different populations, same result as a preventive, and you put it together with the, with the small molecular weight, it's pretty clear that if you block the CGRP mechanism, it has a preventive effect. And that's a pretty big thing to say, I think, because what, it, what, 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 what we're talking about, what we're looking at here as potentially a whole new way of dealing with uh, migraine prevention uh, using monoclonals, which is quite going to revolutionise, I think, the way um, that we practice. Other things that are happening? Um, conscious, okay. Um, what's happened with the erexins is something we've been watching for a while. So the erexins are produced in the hypothalamus. Uh, they're involved in sleep-wake cycling, hormonal regulation, nociceptive processing. There's two, orexin A and orexin B, and there's two receptors. They're called one and two. Orexin A acts at both, orexin B only acts at one. Um, we observed the, these neurons active several years ago in a paper in Neurobiology of Disease. And what we've been able, what we think, what, what we thought was if you block orexin, uh, sorry, if you, if you block orexin A, that would have an antinociceptive effect. And if you were to activate orexin B, the two receptors should have a pro, uh, pro-nociceptive effect. Okay. So what happened when that was tested? What, what industry did was take a dual receptor blocker, so one and two, was developed for sleep and tested it in migraine. This has just come out in cephalalgia. It's a double-blind parallel group, randomised controlled trial, um, looking at a placebo here, and uh, this is uh, phylorexant, so this is a, what's called a DORA, dual orexin receptor antagonist. So it acts, again, at both of these, uh, these receptors. And what you see is nothing, um, in effect, that there wasn't a, 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 an effect. Now, 21%, so again, the, that's pretty much on the money for 50% response rates, so the study's believable. Um, unsurprisingly, there was more somnolence in the, in the uh, phylorexan group because it's been developed as, uh, as a treatment of insomnia. I think the problem is, with this, is it, it doesn't test the question, really, in the sense that this was given once a day, because if you give a sleep-inducing agent at the start of the day, people go to sleep, it's not very useful. So it's probably not sensible to test, to try and expect something that you only covers the uh, receptors half of the time to have a useful effect. That people will then, I think we'll be talking a lot about the outcome from this over a period of, uh, of time and everyone's back to the drawing board on those. What's happening in neuromodulation? I'll say something about the non-invasive thing, so that's really where the cool stuff is going on. First, the vagal nerve stimulators. The first of the studies came out this year. This is open label, um, 30 patients, migraine with and without aura, um, using the um, using the gamma core, two consecutive 90 second doses repeated at 15 minutes. The ITT population. So just taking the first attack for a moment. Modest outcome. Uh, it has to be said. Um, with this is with mild pain, and this is with uh, and this is the first attack. Um, with moderate or severe pain. So these are modest outcomes, well tolerated, uh, and these are the effects across uh, all, all the attacks. So what's going on? Is this going to, is this going to lead anywhere? We think probably that, uh, oh, this is the study of Silverstein's was presented at the American, um, American Headache Society this year, so double blind, um, sham control, so an auditory click, not an electrical control, chronic migraine patients, um, treating for two months, 
So this was a single attack study, so the acute attack study, this is a preventive study, head eight day reduction. Um, all they presented was the per protocol results, uh, which were negative, uh, bottom line. Um, so God only knows what the intention to treat would have been like. No, no adverse event. A little bit disappointing. Um, it has to be. It has to be said. On the other side of it, we've had much more joy in uh, in looking at this uh, device in cluster headache. So this is uh, started using it in cluster headache, as you can see. Um, 19 patients here. It's a paper that's just gone into. It's been accepted in neurology. It'll come out early next year. Um, more chronics than episodics, not surprisingly. Medically refractory people, these are people who really don't respond to uh, much at all. Um, so with twice daily stimulation, and we looked at the one year results where half the patients had improved. That's a modest outcome, you would say, but of people with a refractory chronic cluster headache, it's more than a modest outcome because these people are otherwise headed to have um, invasive or um, partly, so deep brain stimulation would be done by some people. I think that's just wrong, in, you know, not sensible now. Occipital nerve stimulation, perhaps. But I mean, they're going to get things done to them, and getting and stopping some of them having procedures done must be a good thing. Um, acute attacks were treated well when they were. Oxygen and tryptan reduce, uh, use was reduced. And apart from um, some side shift in one patient becoming worse, it's remarkably well tolerated. This is in randomised controlled trial now. And this is a study that Charlie Gore presented at the MTIC meeting looking at standard of care versus um, the non-invasive vagal stimulator and chronic cluster headache. Uh, the bottom line outcome here, 50% responders um, more in the non-invasive uh, VNS than in the standard of care, a little bit of uh, dizziness or uh, neck discomfort in comparison. So that's the, that's the adverse event. So people doing better. Um, not, a, not a shabby cohort either, um, 97 patients with 93 providing, uh, providing data. So reduced number of attacks and uh, people doing better uh, using this device. Both of these things I think support the good randomised controlled trials that are going on with properly, with the device that can be, um, that can properly uh, blind the patient which of course is an issue. Last one is, uh, uh, is CMS, um, it's developed by, uh, actually developed by this fellow Barker, he came to the European Headache Federation Migraine Trust meeting and spoke about how this was all developed, which was pretty exciting. I have to say, it's developed so that David Marsden and his colleagues could do some um, uh, motor reflex uh, work. This was the uh, initial study, um, or the important study, randomised, double blind, placebo controlled. I mean, the important thing with neuromodulation is how you're doing the blinding. What they did here was they got the, the devices to click and, sh and buzz to actually shake and then. Uh, then either deliver a pulse or, or not. And so 67% of people who got just the, the shake and the buzz thought it was real and 72% with shake, buzz and stimulate thought it was real. So pretty good blinding. Um, these are the pain-free rates at two hours on placebo and active. A lot of patients with this in mild pain because they were treating this as a group enriched with uh, aura. And you'll see if you look at mild pain studies with triptan, the par the, the a parallel group paying for a two hour placebo rate actually about 20 to 25 percent across the study. That's pretty much in line um, what, with what you expect. Here's a positive study which is actually well blinded. Uh, it's got a CE mark in Europe so we've been using it. Um, we've looked at it in the, on the animal side of things and what we can show uh, with a, little, a small bespoke uh, TMS device is you can block cortical spreading depression in the rat with it which is quite remarkable and you can block trigeminovascular thalamic transmission, so dural activation recording in thalamus uh, of the rat uh, with, a, with a bespoke TMS device that delivers about one Tesla, the same as a normal device. So this is a pretty, um, it, this, I have to say, I mean, this looks pretty simple, all too simple to be true almost, that's the device and there's a new one being developed. So it was quite reassuring to find at least two animal models where there's a clear effect uh, of these pulses. As we've been using it more in, um, in, uh, in, in clinical practice, this is some work from a poster, um, plus the data even that came after the, the poster in, in practice in the UK. So the 137 patients who've had the device, uh, draw your attention in particular to the chronic migraine patients. We've started to use it as a preventive, um, which, uh, because the patients said that if they used it more often it worked better, and you listen to people, you find out things from time to time. And what we've found quite consistently is a group of people who with continued use get this reduction 
um, in frequency and um, in severity of their headache. And it's some, so it's something that's being explored at the moment as a question. And it's really watch this space to be able to develop something that um, is not invasive and well tolerated as a preventive in migraine. It's very, very exciting. This looks like a big shopping list of things, and it is a big shopping list of things, but I think it just goes to show you how, like, how really incredible the migraine field is at the moment. Now, most, most of us are using the beta blockers or pizotifen, cyproheptadine, amitriptyline, valparate, pyramate as flunarazine, as migraine uh, treatments. I mentioned candesartan as an A2 receptor antagonist. Data for melatonin, we um, might use riboflavin, particularly if we're in Belgium. But that's actually not a bad thing for episodic migraine. I'm not using much fever for you these days, and those coenzyme Q10 should be mentioned. There's such a range of things, but not a single one of these preventives was developed for migraine. And what I just showed you was really exciting things happening in the CGRP space, and there are other things that are happening. And there will come a time in our practicing time where instead of giving a migraine patient um, an anticonvulsant and trying to explain them that they don't have epilepsy or a tricyclic and spending time telling them they're not depressed but we're giving them an antidepressant anyway, we're going to start actually treating patients who've got migraine with migraine drugs. Uh, and I think that's going to be a huge uh, transition um, for, for the patients and for us and in terms of our understanding of, of the disease. And there are things I haven't talked about, the glutamate story, the acid sensing ion channel, nitri uh, nitric oxide, this will be the trip mate story, the next peptide which is pituitary adenylate cyclase peptide, and as we mentioned some of the neuromodulation. This is a very, very exciting um, business to see the, the number of things that are happening. And those of you who are in residency and thinking about what's going to happen, I mean the great thing about headache and about migraine is that Tomorrow in your clinic, um, there'll be people who are there. The more you understand, the easier it is to, to talk to them. And of course, the more therapies we have, the easier it will be to, uh, to treat them. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. I'm, I'm four minutes before the hour. I'm, con I'm conscious of the fact that on a Swiss webinar, I want to stay on time, unless I get myself in uh, a lot of frowning. I don't know if we take questions. Uh, I'm not sure of the format, but I guess the host lady will jump in and tell me. <coughs> or someone else will jump in. <coughs> Stop sharing my desktop just in case it's creating noise. <coughs> Thank you for our moderator today. Ask you to moderate the questions and answers section. Okay, please. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, Peter, we hear you. Hi, Peter, how are you? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you now, Peter. Well done. Okay. Peter Sander, we can hear you. Excellent, yeah. Um, thanks oh. a lot for this excellent talk. Um, do, you, do you actually, looking at the CGRP antagonist story, do we need to completely change our view between a distinction, the traditional distinction between acute and prophylactic therapy? Um, I'm asking the question because we have a big problem dealing with medication overuse headache um, being caused by acute headache medication and now we face a, sub a, a substance class 
that might be used as both prophylactic and acute therapy. And um, somehow this adds a lot of questions to the whole problem of medication overuse headache and how to explain it. Um, could I kindly, politely ask you to speculate on that one or to share your thoughts and speculate as well, maybe? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's exciting, isn't it? That the yeah. idea that we, um, we've had that that all that the acute therapies will all produce medication overuse. Well, that's I mean that's clearly wrong, um, or potentially wrong. I, I think it's clearly wrong actually, because CGRP uh, mechanisms can have both an acute effect and a preventive effect. So you know, looking down the road um, in people who who have a tendency to medication overuse, what a wonderful thing to give them something that can't produce medication overuse, and the more they use it, the better they'll get. So that's because no one got worse in any of those uh, in that CGRP um, study. I think that the explanation, the first pass explanation for it for me, is is that medication overuse is a phenomenon. It's two things. It's the intersection between the propensity, because not everyone gets it who takes these medicines, and the drugs in the sense in their in the sense of their mechanism. So I think agonist drugs probably can do it. By if I if I could if I could see it this way by exhausting receptor mechanisms. So um, triptans are serotonin one B one D agonists, um, opioids opioid uh, agonists. I think cannabinoids do it, uh, cannabinoid agonists. But I but you know the CGRP drugs are antagonists, and I suspect that there's something probably to, uh, about whether you're doing an agonist turning something on that gets um, depleted, so to speak. Um, or you're blocking something, which you don't, you then don't deplete any uh, postsynaptic mechanisms. So that's my, that, that's the way I think uh, about it at, at the moment. Um, I mean, it's also true to say, isn't it, that in the old days people used to use ergots um, at some level in, in short-term prevention, say for menstrual um, headaches, and even people now use phototriptan to do that. So th I think this distinction between acute and preventive from a mechanistic perspective, is probably wrong. Uh, another good example of that is flunarazine. There's a nice, randomised, placebo-controlled, intravenous acute study with flunarazine that shows it's better than placebo. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that holds up the more you, more you look at it. And the medication overuse story is really going to run around um, the nature of the drug action meaning agonist versus antagonist, as opposed to the uh, pharmacology that's of the, the system that's, um, the systems are being manipulated. Thanks a lot. Fascinating and um, interesting to see what will happen in future. Oh, yeah. Peter? Yes. Peter Zando? Peter Zando? <laughs> Peter is going to moderate uh, the questions and answer session, but uh, may I ask a question from Ayao? Um, I have a question concerning the association between stroke and migraine. Do you think this association is based on uh, causation or migraineurs and stroke patients just share some common genetic backgrounds? Can you speculate on this? Yeah, it's a good question and, and it's, important to, uh, it's important to patients, isn't it? I mean, the, it's the first thing to say is um, is the association is an association um, for migraine with aura patients only. When you pull when you pull it out in the studies that have been done properly, so it's not a migraine without aura um, association, which makes it the importance of getting the diagnosis right. I think that I think it's probably. Um, an overlap of the aura physiology with stroke physiology rather than a migraine phenomenon. Because I think of migraine as uh, a, a dishabituation and aura as this activation deactivation process. And so I, I think that in, within that deactivation, um, hyperpolarization, reduced brain blood flow, there's the propensity for stroke in a small group of people, but it really is in this is in this aura group. I don't think it's so I don't really think it's a migraine phenomenon. I think it's an aura phenomenon. And I'll draw the distinction. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Lozan? 
Lausanne, we can hear you. If anyone's in Lausanne who runs into, if Richard uh, Fakoviak's still there, give him my regards. <laughs> okay. Tell him I'm very disappointed that he wasn't on the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the next uh, large clinic is um, Sangal. Are there any questions from Sangal? No, thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone from uh, from Basel, Tishpanda? We see you, but uh, yeah. Okay. I think what we see is the the clinic in um, in Rheinfelden. Are there any questions from Rheinfelden? No, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, great. Thierry, thank you very much. Thank you. Andy? Andy, Gantenbein? Andy, do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks, Peter, for the brilliant overview, as usual. Um, you were showing us the data, the very nice data on premonitory symptoms. And uh -huh. I, I had a question how would the stress fit into this? mechanisms of are it just more suggestible to the stress or, or how would you explain stress and trigger in this whole context of premonitory symptoms? I think the perception of stress that patients get, well, I, I, and I'm not suggesting the premonitory symptoms explain all of this, but I'm, I'm offering it as part of the explanation. I think that the, when patients, I think if you're, if you're br in the premonitory phase, the brain has clearly already started not to work properly. You know? you know, layman way of saying that, um, and, and, and a, a number of things are happening. And I suspect that when the brain starts to dysfunction, patients um, have trouble uh, with, they have cognitive, but the concentration problems, for example, if you ask them about it. So if your brain's not working properly, if you can't concentrate properly, if you can't organise your uh, all the resources, ordinary things must seem stressful. So I think there's a perception of stress where there isn't stress. If, where there isn't an external thing, if you if you understand what I mean, it's the way that the patient's dealing with the circumstance. So I think this idea that, it, that stress is happening may in part be explained by the fact that their attacks already started. Now the question of why reductions in stress would produce headache, that's another that's an interesting one. It may be that the brain is so busy um, with migraine that when they the, the the reduction in stress causes them to change uh, perhaps change these habituation mechanisms. Um, you, you, you published, of course, that church, the work uh, looking at um, BEPs in the way migraineurs overuse their energy, so to speak, to produce um, the BEPs in the, that, that uh, paper this year. So I think that reduced, perhaps the reduced stress is simply the way they have to move, if I want, move their attention around. I realise that's a bit of a woolly answer, but then attentional things are pretty, in a bit of a woolly state. Okay. Thanks a lot, and see you soon in Bern. Well, I hope that we see you in um, in uh, uh, in Valencia at the International Headache Society in Ecuador. Thank you. Thanks.